Hi, my name is Dana Lockett. I'm the Acting Chief of Heritage Documentation Programs. I've been an architect with the programs for approximately 30 years, so I've seen the programs through a lot of different changes um, through the years, and hopefully I will be telling you about some of those changes um, during this presentation. Hopefully you were able to view Catherine Lavoie's presentation on the overview of why the HDP programs exist and, and their missions. I will be focusing more on the production of measured drawings and digital documentation for Habs Hair Howes and describing how HDP integrates um, different measuring techniques in the field and in the office. I just want to state again the importance of the program's missions. Um, it's documenting America's historic resources on a national scale with uniform standards and guidelines and creating a comprehensive public archive of measured drawings, historical reports, and large format photographs, um, all curated by the Library of Congress. And now we have the, the to provide the public with online content, including interactive, interpretive, virtual tours, and 3D digital models of historic resources. HDP re produces, receives, and transmits formal archival materials to the Library of Congress. These include measured drawings in the form of CAD plots on vellum, historical reports printed on archival bond, and large format prints and negatives. Digital versions of these hard copies are also available for download in multiple formats from the LOC website. Field notes are archived in, in, as informal documentation and available only by special request. HDP also produces digital documentation. These products include virtual tours and fly-through videos, CAD drawing files, 3D laser scan models, 3D solid models, and 3D mesh models. The Library of Congress does not accept this digital documentation into the collection at the moment, but that may change in the future. HTP measures sites using several different tools, including terrestrial laser scanning, as you see in this image from the Statue of Liberty, hand measuring total stations, photogrammetry, and GPS, and they each offer their own unique set of advantages. And before you dive into your project, it's extremely important to review the HABS Hair House guidelines. Each program has its own set of guidelines, which will help instruct you in creating all three formal components of documentation. You can download them from our website. Um, this is an example of the hair measured drawing guidelines. And these describe the process of gathering project data, including the survey process, drawing formats, and CAD standards. HDP's current guidelines for drawings focus on hand measuring, um, but we hope to have laser scanning and other digital measuring guidelines soon. The drawing guides also explain how to record field measurements. This will help you create clear and precise notes that can be easily read by other delineators or researchers. For example, by denoting a single measurement in red pen with only three numbers separated by a period, uh, these representing feet, inches, and eighths of inches, um, one can keep the numbers clear and easily read without the clutter of fractions or ticks denoting feet and inches. Hab has even put together a quick field guide which describes the processes of collecting hand measurements along with photos like you see here of an architect capturing the profile of a window using molding comb and then tracing it onto archival paper at full scale. Good hand measuring can be used for the generation of 2D drawings as shown in this plan, as well as isometric drawings represented here in this hand drafted isometric on the right or 3D drawings as shown in this image on the bottom depicting an isometric plot of a 3D CAD drawing. Photogrammetry is the science of extracting measurements from photographs. HDP has been using some form of photogrammetry for decades, but the most uh, recent software we are using called Metashape makes the process of extracting 3D geometry so much easier. The upper left image shows multiple photos taken of a very ornate bronze flagpole base at the Musargon American Cemetery in France, with at least 60% overlapping views, both horizontally and vertically. 
the MetaShape software automatically compares millions of common pixels between the overlapping photographs to produce 3D coordinates for each pixel, creating a point cloud and a mesh model as seen in the second image with the blue rectangles representing the location from where the images were taken. The lower left image shows the mesh model flattened into an ortho photo, which is taken into AutoCAD where it is traced to create a 2D drawing. The large image on the right shows the CAD drawing plotted with line weights onto vellum. Uh, now I'll walk through the process of using photogrammetry to capture a column capital at the Mu Sargon American Cemetery Chapel, seen in the upper left image with isolation shown in the upper right image. Coded scale bars are placed in or around the subject as shown in the image on the lower left so that the highly accurate measurements can be introduced into the software's processing algorithms to give the final model precise scale. This image on the lower right shows all of the th thumbnail camera views captured with at least 60% overlap, as well as the rotation of the camera from landscape to portrait and back to landscape views so that that um, and that will introduce camera calibration into MetaShape's process. So now let me go into the actual software and show you the results after processing all of the images. You can see here that the all of the images have been input into MetaShape. As I rotate around, you can see all of the blue rectangles, which represent where each image was taken from. And if I zoom in a little closer, you can see the low res point cloud that is done after the first processing pass of the software. I'm going to turn off the cameras now. And I'm going to go to the second phase of processing where it creates a high density point cloud. So this is still made up of points. They're just really, really dense. So if I zoom in here, you can see the individual points. And I zoom back out. They look more opaque. And then the software creates a mesh in between all of these points and attaches texture from the images to that mesh. And that's what you see here is the mesh covered with the actual photographic images. And you can see how much detail is shown in this in this 3D mesh model. And this is what the ortho image is extracted from, then taken into AutoCAD and traced. These are the highly detailed drawings created from that tracing of the photogrammetric photogrammetric ortho images imported into AutoCAD. And so you can see all of the detail that you can extract out of these ortho images. HTP uses a Leica total station to capture real extremely accurate control for the registration of laser scan data. The same targets or locations seen in these first two images are captured with both the laser scanner and the total station. The total station data is set to override or control the scanner's targets, allowing the point cloud registration to take advantage of the total station's higher degree of precision and offering a much more accurate model. All of the scanning and total station is recorded in metadata forms seen in the images on the right that will be included in the project's field notes. And then the resulting registration report seen on the lower left will be used as verification of accuracy for the project. The Historic American Landscape Survey used handheld GPS units to map a large landscape that would be difficult to measure any other way. These two black and white images show Tassai Ranch, one of several early 20th century cattle ranches within the Grand Canyon Parashat National Monument in Arizona. This overall bird's eye view of Tassai Ranch reveals a landscape where ranchers utilize the natural springs with reservoirs and irrigation ditches to water the fields. Um, measurements of the fields were captured by simply walking the boundaries with the handheld GPS device while recording satellite readings.
The most significant features of this site were captured with the laser scanner, though. These two are screen captures of the laser scan data, including the natural spring, its winding ditch to the reservoir, and the ranch house and barn. Um, and these are all accurately placed within the larger landscape captured with the GPS unit. This site plan drawn in the upper left image includes the entire set with all of the combined features from the laser scan data and the GPS measurements. The plan drawn in the lower right is an enlarged plan detail to better describe the house and the corral area of the ranch. We almost always use terrestrial laser scanning in our documentation process. There are several terms in the industry that the industry uses to describe the technology. There is terrestrial versus aerial laser scanning. There is high definition surveying. Um, most people have heard of LIDAR and probably the most generic is just 3D scanning. Our very first laser scanning project was at the Statue of Liberty in 2006. This slide shows images from each stage of the process from the post scanning process um, from the raw point cloud shown in this image to the more defined mesh model shown here to the 2D CAD drawing traced from the mesh and to the plotted drawing you see here on vellum. Uh, for those of you not familiar with laser scanning, here's a short video that explains it quite well. A laser scanner emits a rapidly pulsing or continuous laser beam. As it emits the beam, the scanner automatically rotates around its vertical axis, and a rapidly spinning or oscillating mirror also moves the beam up and down. The result is a systematic sweeping of the beam over the area. When the beam hits an object, some of its energy bounces back to the scanner, where if the returned energy signal is strong enough, a sensor detects it and a timer uses it to calculate the distance from the scanner to the object. For each distance measurement, additional critical data is recorded, including the corresponding horizontal angle of the rotating laser and the corresponding vertical angle of the moving mirror. The scanner automatically combines these to calculate a 3D X, Y and Z coordinate position for each point. The resulting scan is a set of 3D coordinate measurements. It's a detailed 3D representation of the scene, often called a point cloud. And to add realistic texture or color to scans, matching photos can be taken. So while I still think this technology is like magic, trustful laser scanning and can also have unwanted issues with range or reflectivity. Glass and mirrors can cause false returns, as seen in this image, with the data in orange being reflected duplicate of the real data shown in the yellows. Scanning at 300 meter range can give you minimal returns compared to scanning at a 50 meter range, as you can see in these two images, comparing details of the same subject scanned at different ranges. This image of a lighthouse lantern shows how black surfaces can give spotty returns and this final images, image shows how the high gloss surface of a vehicle can give unreliable or no returns at all. This video fly through of the laser scan data from Fort Jefferson at Dry Tortugas National Park is an excellent example of the quality and depth of information that can be captured using this technology. The black areas are water, of course, around the moat on the exterior of the fort. Um, that does, water does not return any, any data from the scanner, so it just shows up as black. We can also take these scan data and slice down through them, which is basically how we capture uh, plans, elevations, and sections with the data by slicing through them and drawing um, what we see on the screen.
So that's in a section slice, and then it's going to rebuild it back, sliding out to the end. But you can see how much detail is captured in this data sense scan set. Two D drawings are typically extracted from the point cloud by tracing the point cloud with two D polylines on a specified elevation above the point cloud. Here you can see the three D point cloud of the Pukohola Heiau sitting below the two D polyline tracing of the Heiau plan. Um, by viewing the point cloud in the ortho mode plan view, the delineator can see exactly what to trace. This is an image of the, hay, of the final Heiau site plan plotted onto vellum, showing the stacked lava rock in detail. And in this particular drawing where the stonework had collapsed in places due to an earthquake. We laser scanned NASA's rocket engine test stands in Santa Susana, California, using the Leica C10 long range scanner with the intent of creating 3D CAD solid models that would easily allow us to extract 2D drawings from different positions and views. This is a plan view of that point cloud data with all of the individual scans registered in Leica's Cyclone software showing the position of each scan station represented here by the yellow triangles. We broke off of the main traverse around the site to perform more detailed scanning up inside the test stands. These random scale orange and red colors you see here are called an intensity mapping. Um, they represent the reflectivity of the surface the laser is bouncing off of, not true color. The onboard scanner camera is not the best quality, so we use an external high resolution camera on a nodal ninja bracket to capture the high dynamic range images to color the point clouds. You can see in the image on the left that the bracket placed on the same tripod position after scanning locates the camera at the same height as the laser on the scanner so that the data is being captured from the exact same point. While the laser scanner rotates on its own, the camera must be rotated manually to capture the spherical panophotos in six shots. Uh, once the spherical panophoto has been created in PTGUI software and flattened into an equirectangular projection like you see here on the right image, PTGUI software can, can convert it into a cube map. And these can be mapped um, to the point cloud data set. The spherical panophoto can also be used in the creation of virtual tours with 360 degree views. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with these online virtual tours, and I'll, I'll go over that to, toward the end of the presentation. This fly through video shows the COCA test stand point cloud with the colors mapped to the scans. So you can see the complexity of the site and the landscaping is quite dramatic. As we fly through, you can see differences in the point cloud density. So on the structures, the density is much higher, meaning the, the points are much closer together. And then the landscape, which we didn't need to capture so much detail on, the points are much more sparse and you can kind of see through them. They have a transparent look. So this is how we scanned all the way through the site. The, the 360 degree scan was a little lighter than the scans that we performed on the actual test stand. Um, because the scan, test, scan, test stands are so complicated, we couldn't scan everything at high resolution, so we did portions of them at super high density so that we could extract the data that we needed out of them. And as we fly through here, you can see that with this 3D scan data, you can view it from any angle. So you can view it from below, from the air, 
from a, a, you know an aerial view so you can view it from any angle that you prefer to, and we chose a path through this uh, site so that we could create a, this video. And as we fly by the test stands close up, you can see how much detail exists in the scan data set. How large they are. You can see that the colors are really vivid. That comes from the high dynamic range, taking different exposures with the camera and then having the software combine all of those exposures to get the best possible color data from it. You can see some blank areas in some of the structures. That was because of occlusion. Um, if the laser scanner can't see certain things, and it doesn't pick up that data. So call it also shadowing. So if you if a post or a column is in front of something, it will block the laser from capturing what's directly behind it. So that requires you moving around the site into different positions to capture more data. This video shows the process of turning a point cloud into a 3D model, and it can take several weeks depending upon the complexity of the structure and the actual solids that need to be created. Um, for this project, we used Pharaoh's as built plugin for AutoCAD to slice and extrude the solids seen here in this model. Um, plugins and software are getting better at automating the extraction of some shapes, such as piping, still channels, cylinders, and end caps. Um, but the work can still be quite time consuming. So you can see in this uh, video capture of, of one of our architects drawing the 3D solids from the scan data. He's isolated a particular section through an I-beam and now he's turned it so that he's viewing it in profile and he's going to trace the actual profile on top of this point cloud. Sometimes it's difficult to see exactly the shape. Um, that's why it's important to make sure you're scanning at the correct density and um, right coverage so that you're picking up all of the detail that you need. You can see in this particular profile um, that all of the flange of this I-beam was not captured because it was up too high. Um, but there was enough data on the edges on the corner of the of the flanges to to estimate where those are. So now he's added this region that represents the profile of that I beam. And now he's going to extrude it so that it becomes a 3D solid. So now he's turned on more of the point cloud data so that they can see where the ends of this solid needs needs to be extruded to. So he's taking the end of the solid to its end point at the top. And now he's dragging the bottom of the solid to its termination. And now he's just inspecting that it data as well. So 
So the delineator does repeats this several thousands of times to create the entire 3D solid model of the test stand. The 3D solid model shown here can make it much easier to create 2D drawings, such as plans, elevations, and isometrics by slicing and rotating the model to specific views, and then using AutoCAD commands to flatten the 3D model um, from that specific view. The plan drawings of the test stand shown here were created by slicing the 3D model at specific levels and using AutoCAD commands to, to project a 2D line drawing. The next image shows an elevation of the test stand created from an ortho view of the 3D model. Similarly, the seismetric was created from an aerial view of the 3D CAD model. Once the 3D model has been flattened into 2D line drawings, line weights, texture, and shading can be added to give the drawings a more realistic and artistic and rendered look. This video will describe the process HTP used to create an elaborate drawing set for the Space Shuttle Orbiter Discovery, incorporating several different software to achieve 3D models and 2D line drawings. You can see some of the elements on the shuttle are missing, such as a, a piece of the front nose. The engines were located in, at a different uh, location, and the ohms pods were like little motors in the back um, are, are missing as well. Um, we were not able to actually see the ohms pods um, during this project so we were able to take that data from existing engineering drawings and create 3d models from it this is an underview of the shuttle and it's um, flame retardant tiles you can see because this is just raw scan data that it's a little transparent it's hard to see exactly what is there um, with, with the without the correct software this is seen um, this is video was created using point tools um, but other programs will allow you to see the point cloud a little clearer um, but we find that adding uh, other 3d solids or mesh um, to these will create better a better set of drawings so this will walk us through that process So you can see that the three the drawings created, 2D drawings are are quite elaborate and are taken from this combo mesh and solid solid model. You can see the ohms pods are added onto that solid model and the engines, which we scanned at a different location. We just took those and placed them in the correct position um, on the shuttle. So that it creates a complete model. And this really allows you to see the texture on the surface of the shuttle. With the mesh overlaid and the texture, it really makes everything out and much more clear than just the raw scan data. And then the awesome set of drawings that we can create using that 3D model. It's the team. And of course, our photographer went out to capture the shuttle and it was being flown out to um, Udvar Hazy Museum, where it now resides. So we find ourselves mesmerized by what digital measuring methods can accomplish and incorporate it into all of our projects 
It can greatly reduce the amount of time needed in the field. It can capture extreme amounts of data, way more data than you would normally consider using hand measuring methods. It is great at accommodating non-contact data acquisition if the structures are fragile or dangerous. And the post-processing workflow can generate a wide range of products beyond 2D drawings, um, such as this 3D model and animated fly-through you see here. And now let me take you through a virtual tour of the Arlington Memorial Bridge. The George Washington Memorial Parkway was going to replace the bascule span, which was an opening span in the bridge. Not many people realized that this was a drawbridge, um, but when they they stopped using it in the 60s, because there was no more boat traffic going up and down this particular part of the river. Um, but they, the bascule span was failing, so they wanted to go in and replace it with a fixed span. Um, so this is a 360 degree pano photo you see here, so I can rotate around and I can zoom in. The little red cameras that you see are called hotspots. So you can go in and view different items that are pointed out within the virtual tour. There's a map in the upper right hand corner showing where you are in the virtual tour. So I can click on one of these hotspots and this actually goes to an aerial photo taken by one of our um, hair architects. Or I can select a different area that shows the iconic buffalo and the, um, at the point in the arch um, taken with the laser scanner. Or I can jump to a different view on the bridge, as you see here. which shows more drawings from the from the drawing set that was transmitted to the Library of Congress. Or we can do, go down inside. And view the interior. And this final image is the actual bascule span itself. So we're just below the, the deck of the bascule span, the opening span. And this is the structure underneath that, that, that was all being replaced. And then you can go to other hotspots. This actually shows the locking mechanism when the bridge was closed. This is the mechanism that actually locked those end pieces together so that there was no movement. And another drawing showing what this bascule span looks like in elevation. But the digital methods can fall short in some areas. It's difficult um, to obtain 100% coverage, as you see in the Statue of Liberty image on the left. Her shoulders, the torch flame, and the top of her head cannot be captured at this time due to lines of sight and reflectivity issues. The small scale details shown in the upper right are difficult to extract with laser scanning alone, as you see in this comparison of the window profile captured with the laser scanner versus with a profile comb. The hardware and software can be extremely expensive. It's around $100,000 for long range scanners, and we spend approximately $30,000 for software subscriptions every year for about 10 architects. It also tends to limit exploration. Standing back from the structure to operate the machinery can let you miss certain details, but not looking up close to it. Um, the post-processing can be very time consuming as well, while also requiring a significant learning curve. 
and the born digital data does not yet meet our archival standards. We are currently working with the Library of Congress and the National Archives to see if HDP will be able to submit some digital data in the near future purposes. So in conclusion, um, we believe that the best method of measuring should be decided according to each individual project. And we also strongly believe that each project should receive specific evaluation and translation by professionals in the field of historic preservation. This will ensure accurate documentation is achieved. Um, please visit us on the website at our Facebook page or YouTube channel and explore our exhibits page for more digital models and virtual tours like you've seen here today. Thank you for joining us and I hope to see you soon.